Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this uh, February 6th Sunday at St. John United Church in the Wild Lake Interfaith Center in the city of Columbia, Maryland. We are so delighted that we are able to gather in our worship space today, welcoming back just a very small team of leadership for this worship service um, because of the uh, still high levels of the COVID virus in our community. But we extend a special greeting to everyone joining us through our live stream platform. platform. I'm Mary Kay Canahan, pastor of the congregation, and our liturgist today leading in worship is Gael Sama. As we continue to watch the COVID rates in our community, we will let you know when it is safe to regather and welcome everyone back into our worship space at 1030 on Sunday mornings. If you miss seeing one another, remember that on Sunday evenings, you can join us for Sundays at 7 using the Zoom link found in our e-news flash or on our website, you can join us for a brief time of connection and laughter and sharing. We hope to see you then. This being the first Sunday of the month of February, we celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion. And so, as you are at home, at your own tables, we welcome you to be prepared to participate in the celebration of the Lord's table by having some juice, some crackers or bread, maybe even lighting a candle or setting a special image in front of you that helps you focus on this means of grace, the sacrament of Holy Communion. You will notice in our sanctuary uh, from some of the wider shots that we are displaying a new banner in our community. It is a banner to be held for, uh, hung for the month of February, celebrating um, and our acknowledgement of Black History Month. Our opening song today is a traditional hymn of the church. Our music today is brought uh, through recording and uh, the instrumental accompaniment is by Patty Hammer, who is here in our worship space today. Our opening song is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You may join in singing at home.
Join us in the call to worship. The voice of the war interrupts our lives and fills our ears. Call us into your way of life, O God. The complaints of others settle in our minds and cloud our vision. Lead us into your vision of life, O God. The cries of the poor, the oppressed, and the outcast pierce our hearts. Guide us in your example of living for others, O God. Fill our hearts, fill our eyes, fill our ears with your love for God. Let us be your hands and feet in the world, O God. Let us worship you together. Join us in the prayer of confession. O oh Lord, forgive us when we fail to respond to your call with faith. Through your spirit, we stand in the assurance of your acceptance. Forgive us when we are shackled by our narrow understanding of discipleship and our clouded sense of purpose. Through your spirit, we are drawn into the illumination of your empowering love. Forgive us when we are frightened of the future or pulled back from the demands of your calling. Forgive us when we fail to sense your presence in our past, to acknowledge your grace in a present moment and trust you for our future. Through your discipleship spirit, we offer ourselves in discipleship. We stand, stand together, together as your disciples. disciples. We, we seek renewed and renewing faith. faith. Touch, Touch us now with your spirit, spirit Lord. Lord. Touch, Touch us now with your spirit. Our scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he, he appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God, that it is with me. Whether then it was I or they, or so we proclaim, and so you have come to leave. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As from Luke chapter five, once while Jesus standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, the crowd was passing in on him to hear the word of God. He saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were fishing and was washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have walked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. 
And so also were James and John, son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, in this writing that the Apostle Paul has given us, he wants people to remember one very important thing, the greatest thing. Do you remember what it was from last week? Let me hear you. Or why don't you show me? Do you remember? Yes, we made a heart shape because the greatest thing to remember about God is love. That's what Paul was writing about when he wrote to the people in Corinth to remind them that God's love was made known to them 
in the life and the stories of Jesus. He tells people to remember the greatest story that he, Paul, told of God's love in the life of Jesus, his death for our sins and his rising to new life. So my young friends, friends of all ages, I wonder if there is someone in your life who made God's love real for you. Is it a parent? A grandparent? Maybe an auntie or an uncle? A neighbor or maybe even a teacher? See, Paul recognized that some people were starting to forget about God's love. And so he reminds them of the story that he told that was so convincing in the beginning when he told it that many people came to believe in Jesus and that they should remember that story and pass it on to others. And that's how God's love gets made known. When we know, when you know, and I know for ourselves God's love, we want to share that in ways, by the things that we say and the things that we do, so that others can also know God's love. So our conversation heart today is a blue one that says this. It has the number one, let me see. Okay, it has the number one, which means the word one, I love. One I love. Because that's God's message to you today and to me today, that you and I are ones whom God loves. Now, Jesus came to show us how much God loves us. In other words, Jesus says to each of us that you are one I love. Now, I would like each of you to think about, let's see, think about, <laughs> there we go. Think about someone who showed to you that you are one that God loves. Who came to mind when I asked you that question earlier? Was it a parent or a grandparent, a relative, a teacher, a friend or neighbor? And I want you to give thanks to that person. If that person is in your house right now, I want you to turn and look at them. And I want you to say, you are one that God loves. Okay. We are going to pray to also pass on this message that everyone we meet is one whom God loves. Because that is how the message of God's love gets made known in the world. So do you remember um, how we're going to pray these days? Let's see if I can tuck this here. Maybe not. We hold our hands in the shape of a heart. Okay, and let us pray. God of love, we give thanks for reminding us constantly how much you love us. Thank you for our conversation heart today that reminds us that we are one that you love. Help us, knowing that love, to take that message to someone else who needs to hear you are one God loves. Thank you for the gift of Jesus and his life-giving message that reminds us every day how much you love us. Amen. Amen. And our heart today joins the others that said, Be love. Love you, you are kind, and you and me. Look at all these beautiful conversation hearts. Friends, I want to invite you, maybe while you're out or asking someone in your household, to see if you can't find some conversation hearts 
in the store, as we get closer to a holiday or a cultural tradition in our community called Valentine's Day, and see if you see some of these messages on those hearts. Thank you. Well, the story of unending love and being the body of Christ. This week, we are talking about how to hold on to God's love when we are at risk of forgetting how much God loves us. Remember, the letter that the Apostle Paul is writing is to the church at Corinth, and it's a church of humans who are experiencing some challenges in multicultural community. You can find those lessons again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the fifth chapter of Luke today. As we have been on this journey through the book of Corinthians and the letter that the Apostle Paul has written, we have learned how God's one Holy Spirit brings Jesus' followers together and makes them one body, even as each of them is gifted and created uniquely with different talents and reminds them that no one is better or more important than another. And he says the greatest and best gift, you know, the one we read about last week, the gift that holds it all together, and never ends is love. Well, this week, the Apostle Paul reminds us of how that story of God's love was made known to him, and then he spread it through the communities. And he walks the people through the story of his own conversion, his own inadequacies, and his gratitude for what God has done in him and how he is therefore compelled to share his life message with others. So I ask all of you, as I asked our children and youth a few minutes earlier, do you remember when God's love was made real for you? When God's love became something that you could count on, hold, firmly. Now for some, like the Apostle Paul, it might be a moment, a moment that was so significant that it turned your life around, like his, from, from being someone who persecuted followers of Jesus to being fully convinced of the reality of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, that he then became a different person, taking on a different name. That's Paul's story. And as a result, Paul's spiritual gifts were evangelism and apostleship. That's the ability to plant and create new communities of faith. And missionary, relate to people of all kinds and places and all varieties of culture and unwavering faith. In our United Methodist history, we have the example of John Wesley, Someone who was raised in the faith, nurtured by a very disciplined and instructive mother of 17 children who taught him well. And then growing up and embarking and embracing a call to the ministry, he found himself as an adult ministering at the bedside of a sick friend where scripture was being read aloud and he found that somehow his heart, his heart was strangely warmed. And he felt in a moment that his whole being was embraced and known by God and says that he knew in his head to be true that the life-giving message of Jesus' birth and life and death and resurrection included him. In other words, he remembered, friends, 
that he too was one whom God loved. One whom God loved. You have your own story. You have a moment or a series of moments where God's love was made real to you. <clears throat> Perhaps you have a moment like the Apostle Paul or like John Wesley or maybe even like the amazing trailblazing African-American preacher and woman Jarena Lee who on one Sunday in 1817 attended Mother Bethel African American, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. She had been a household servant, but a, had become a Christian nearly a decade before that in a moment of conversion, sort of like what Paul and John Wesley experienced. And within her, it awoke a desire to preach. And even though she had expressed this calling to her church leaders, she had never taken the pulpit until that day in 1817. Somehow, the regularly scheduled preacher, the Reverend Richard Williams, was not able to speak the words he had prepared. And at the nudging of the Holy Spirit, Jarena Lee rose from up out of the congregation and took her place in the midst of the congregation and began to preach. And she said that during her time of exhortation, God made manifest God's power in a way that was so convincing and so sufficient to show the world that she too was called to labor according to the gifts and ability that she had been given and the grace of God. In the congregation, little did she know that Richard Allen, the AME church founder and denominational bishop, who was also serving as Mother Bethel's pastor, was in their presence that day. See, Jarena had told Bishop Lee and Allen of her aspirations eight years ago, but she, they had not felt comfortable letting a woman speak from the pulpit. But that Sunday, Bishop Allen changed his mind and became convinced that God's gift was operating in Jarena Lee that day. And following this, Jarena would embark on a career of public preaching. The first African-American woman to preach the gospel publicly. She preached to racial, racially mixed uh, United or Methodist congregations at that time, Presbyterians, Baptists, and Wesleyan audiences across the Mid-Atlantic, Lower Canada, Cincinnati, Detroit, and New England. And what's more, she did this at a time when slavery was still legal and neither African Americans nor women could own property or vote. Thanks be to God for the life of Jarena Lee, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to give her the words to say that would convert lives all across this land. Now friends, you and I have our own experience of God's love to hold firmly to. And let me tell you, if it happens to be a moment, a moment like the Apostle Paul experienced on the Damascus Road that was blinding and then illuminating and turned his life around, so be it. Or if it was a heartwarming moment that you can name and remember, like John Wesley had at the bedside of a sick friend, that's great. Or if it was like Jarena Lee who had a moment that she kept kind of quiet and hidden for years, but then had it to be uh, burst forth into her congregation and confirmed in community. Thank God for that and honor it. That kind of experience is possible, but not required. 
in order to have something to hold firmly to. Perhaps like so many, it is not a singular moment in one's life, but a growing revelation of the various ways God has been made real to you. Because let's face it, evangelism is not a popular word or a widely embraced activity or welcome in the general public. Even though as Christians we recognize that this is part of our calling to tell the good news of Jesus, there's a lot of hesitancy about doing it. In a 2019 uh, Barna poll, almost half of the millennial generation, 47%, feel that evangelism is a problematic practice. Among Gen Xers, 27% don't like to hear about evangelism. And even 19% of boomers and 20% of pre-boomers are hesitant to embrace and tell a story like the Apostle Paul did. Well, I'm here today to tell you that the good news is that God has given a lot of gifts to the church in ways that help us to hold firmly to the life-giving message of Jesus that does not involve us having to preach like Paul or John Wesley or Jarena Lee. You know, one of the most important exercises I ever did in my faith journey that confirmed uh, my faith and God's work in my life was in confirmation class. Not my own confirmation class when I was 13, but the confirmation class I participated in as a mother of young children when I was asked to walk as a mentor with another youth who was preparing to confirm their own faith. And one of the things we had to do in working with our youth was to go back, go way back, as they say, in our life and craft a timeline of our own spiritual autobiography, like a map of our life journey, and then talk about it together. The moments like our baptism and our own confirmation, or the times uh, when we went to vacation Bible school or perhaps did a service project. And then also include the highs of our lives, the hopes, the dreams, the exciting celebrations, and also the lows. And in that timeline to remember where we were, who was with us, and where God was working. And we had to talk about it together. So we shared our own humble beginnings and vulnerabilities and what that helped me see. As an adult in her 30s, that God had been at work in so many ways and so many places in my life and circumstances and with people who gave me something I could hold firmly to, that I could see for myself the evolution of my faith and the different ways that God showed up and the different ways I experienced God. Our faith has given us so many different ways to know and make known the love of God in Jesus Christ. You remember the gifts that have been given to all of us that we read about in chapter 12 living in, in you and in me and in all the people we meet, are ways of experiencing God and the risen Christ in the world. In chapter 12, some of those were outlined. So when your life is in conflict, turmoil, fractured or broken like the people of Corinth were experiencing, hold firmly to the message about God that you were given at some point in your life. Maybe, like in chapter 12, as is described, the gift of hospitality, maybe it is someone or a family who welcomed you in with such radical hospitality that you knew for sure that you were loved and you were wanted and you were worthy. 
Maybe there was someone with the gift of healing or mercy when you were sick or when your heart was breaking that made the love of God known to you. Or someone with the gift of exhortation or encouragement who helped you remember how much God is for you even when you can't believe in yourself. Or someone with the gift of sacrificial generosity when you were in need. Someone with the gift of teaching, maybe, who helped the light bulbs go off when you wanted to understand in your head what it was you knew in your heart about Jesus. All of those things are ways that God has shown up in your life and is something that you can hold on to firmly when your life, your family, or the church, or the world is disjointed or fracturing. The author of 1 Corinthians, Paul, is able to tell his story in such a way that it is authentic because it is his story. It impacted and changed lives and brought people together and birthed churches in the lands of his travels. And he brought his whole self to the community with the most authentic expression of what he had been given to God, by God the ability to preach, the ability to plant churches and be a missionary. And you and I are called to express that same kind of authentic being to the world. It is who we are, gifted by grace, because you and I may be like the persons we were just naming in our prayers and giving thanks for, a moment ago. We may be part of someone else's story when they are asked, who made God real to you? When did God become a real person? And you, yourself, and I, myself, with embodied gifts of leadership or spirit music, craftsmanship or prayer, all wrapped up in the greatest gift of love will be the answer. And so, friends, we need to go back and remember, individually or together, where God's love was first made real and known to us. When we first experienced that love or our first love, Oftentimes in marriage preparation or marriage counseling, I ask couples, what did you first notice about the other? When and how did you meet? And then how did you get to know each other? And then when did you know that your love was real? And I remind them to make note of those answers. That when times are difficult and the relationship is strained, perhaps even at the point of fracturing, that it is helpful to go back and remember where it started, in God. To recapture and hold firmly to those first feelings and emotions and thoughts and decisions that led to love. And we also remember that God is the third person in any relationship between two people. So last week we read one of the most well-known chapters in the Bible about what love is. And friends, I want to remind you that each of you, by your gifts and graces, embody that love to the world that you yourself are the image of Christ, a gift and a blessing to the world. And so when we hear these words from the Apostle Paul, let us each be encouraged to remember 
that you and I have our own story of faith to tell, that it is as authentic as what Paul had to preach, even without saying the same thing, that you and I have the ability to make the good news, the gospel, made known in the world. That is the authority that Paul claims that it is God's message living in him, that it is Christ alive in his life who gets all the credit and all the glory, not himself. And so in our relationship, it is too, the image of God that radiates from you and I in our living and our doing. And so friends, hold firmly to the faith that Jesus is who he says he is and that out of that relationship comes our motivation for unity and appreciation for our differences and our life together in the church and in the world. Hold firmly to that fundamental relationship, to that first word made alive, to the initial hope that is Jesus the Christ. Hold firmly. Amen. I'm joining me in a time for generosity. Gracious and merciful God, we offer our gifts to you. This day with open hands and open hearts. We know there have been days where we have clung to money for our security, to try to control our future. At times we've been tempted to believe that in gaining more, we will find salvation. Open our ears and minds to hear the truth from your Apostle Paul. We need only hold firmly to your promises made real in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, which will save us. In the holy name of Jesus, our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger, and all who believe in me shall not test. With Christians around the world and throughout the centuries, we gather with these gifts of bread and wine, simply elements that speak of nourishment and transformation and our means of grace by which you are present in the holy mystery. Let us pray. Loving, Loving God, God, we, we thank, thank you that, that you are so close to us, us as breath, breath that, that your love, love is constant and unfailing. We thank you for all that sustains life, and especially for Jesus Christ, who teaches us how to live out an ethic of justice and peace, and for the promise of transformation made manifest in his life, death, and resurrection. We ask you to bless this bread and this cup. Through this meal, we make us the body of Christ, that we may join with you in promoting the well-being of all creation. Amen. Amen. So friends, we remember on the night when Jesus and his disciples had their last meal together, that Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat it as often as you do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, poured it in giving thanks he gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often 
as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, friends, in the symbol of the broken bread, we participate in the life of Christ and dedicate ourselves to being his disciples for the transformation of the world. And in the symbol of the cup, we participate in the new life that Christ brings. And so now, Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ as we are made one in ministry um, with each other and to the world and with Christ for the sake of the transformation of the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we hope that you have taken a moment to set your table. At this time, those who are part of our worship leadership today are welcome to come forward. You will receive um, the bread, and we have gluten-free elements so everyone can participate, and you will receive the juice in a single cup that you may take and return uh, to your seat. Let us pray. We give thanks, loving God, that you have refreshed us at your table. Strengthen our faith. Increase our love for one another. As we have been fed by the seed that became grain and then became bread, may we go out into the world to plant seeds of justice, transformation, and hope. Amen. Our closing song today is a global, multicultural version of Amazing Grace.
grace How sweet the sound What So much has changed in our world lately. Wo auch immer du bist, ruf seinen Namen an. Jesus. Jesus. Don't wait another day. Filled with, with God's grace, we will go to share hope with those in despair, to befriend the lonely and afraid. Filled with God's grace, we are empowered by the Spirit to bring peace into all the brokenness around us, to walk in faith beside our sisters and brothers. Amen. <laughs>